So the FOMC meeting just concluding, the press conference just concluding. Do you think that Jay Powell is handling the economy in the right way with today's decision? I, I actually do. Look, I think Jay was put into a very difficult position, but he's actually handled it very well. I listened to the, the, the conference. Difficult? How so? And I, and look, and I think Jay acknowledged that the United States economy is growing and is growing well. But if you look at what's going on in other parts of the world right now, he's having to deal with the slowing economic conditions in other parts of the world. So on one hand, the United States continues to grow and continues to show good signs of strength, but other parts of the world continue to slow. And he's trying to balance the equation between domestic growth and global growth. And that's a, that's a pretty difficult part of the equation. He's also realizing that, look, we do not have a lot of inflation in the United States. And in fact, the only real inflation we hope will have in the United States is wage inflation. We've seen wages in the United States get up to 3.1 percent. So we're starting to see some real wage growth in the United States. But outside of that, we really don't have inflation in the United States. And I know, as the chairman of the Fed, you're always worried about being behind the curve on inflation. So I think that, that Jay and the rest of the committee is doing a pretty good job here. Are you personally concerned about a slowdown, given some of the risks that are out there and a lot of people who come on CNBC, uh, Ray Dalio? Uh, uh, to name one, Scott Minard has recently said so that they're concerned that a recession is in the near future. Well, I, I've been teasing you and a lot of your colleagues recently that CNBC seems to be obsessed with the recession. I'm not obsessed with the recession. I actually think the United States is in pretty good shape. We continue to see the very positive effects of the stimulus from tax cuts in the United States. We haven't even seen a tax filing season yet. No one's really filed their taxes yet to see what the effect is. I think the effect is going to be quite positive, not only on the business side, but equally as important on the personal side. We continue to see the consumer in the United States spend money. Yes, we saw a funny consumer confidence number yesterday, but remember, that data was taken during the middle of a government shutdown. It's hard to have real consumer confidence during the middle of a government shutdown. So I believe that the consumer is going to continue to spend in the United States. We have a five-year investment cycle for companies to invest in the United States. We'd like to see more capital investment in the United States. But look at what's going on in these external factors. The rest of the world is slowing down a little bit. We've got a lot of discussion about trade and the price of underlying commodities, steel and aluminum that you need to build factories. So companies have yet to invest. When we start seeing that investment cycle, I think the U.S. economy will continue to grow. Now, you have been outspoken about the tariffs. You've been outspoken about the shutdown, saying that neither are really what the country needs at this time. Have you lost confidence in this administration from an economic standpoint since you've left the White House? I've made my point on tariffs and on trade very clear. You know, U.S. consumers are paying the tariffs. No foreign entity has paid a dollar of tariff to the U.S. government. So when we make goods more expensive for the U.S. consumer, it means that they can buy less other goods or less other services or even worst of all, save less money. That's not what we should be doing to our consumers. So I feel very strongly that it is our job to make goods as cheap as possible in the United States so our consumers can consume as much as they want and hopefully save at the end of the day. Now, in terms of that tax stimulus that you talked about a few questions ago, um, there was recently an NABE survey that came out a few days ago which said that about 84 percent of people surveyed believed that they hadn't really felt much of an impact from the tax bill, that they haven't increased their hiring, they haven't increased their CapEx spending as a result. What's going on there? Are you disappointed with these results? Or? Well, look, I, I think there's a, a couple different things going on. You know, we, we came out with this great, great tax plan. We came out with a great deregulation plan, both meant to stimulate, stimulate growth. On the flip side, we've come out with some things that are anti-stimulative mm -hmm. at the same time. And you and I both know that corporations, A, take a long time to do their CapEx plan. You know, companies can't decide today that they're going to go buy you know, a 100-acre piece of land and go build a factory. They need to buy the, buy the land, design the factory, get the permits. That itself will take a year or two. That's why we made the investment window a five-year investment window. But then if you see the price of steel go up, you see the price of machinery goes up, it gets less and less compelling to build that factory. So we need to make it compelling for people to build those factories, and we need to keep people investing in the businesses. So look, my view is that investment will come when there's more and more clarity in what our trade relationships are with countries around the world. Is there a risk that it's too late, though, that, that the, the 
the benefit of that stimulus will come to pass by the time the government figures out its way on trade and figures its way out with regard Look, to the shutdown. There's risk to everything. When you're dealing with corporate decision making, you're dealing with economic growth, you're dealing with jobs, there's always risks. You know, things happen that you could never foresee or foreshadow, things good and bad. So there's risk to all of these scenarios. What we're hoping is we stay more or less on the path and trajectory that we hoped we would be on. We continue to have companies be more competitive in the world environment because our tax rate makes them more competitive. We'll continue to hire more people. In fact, you see that. We've got an unemployment rate below 4%. We'll continue to have qualified, skilled labor in the United States to hire from, and we'll continue to grow our economy. But these things take time. As I said, we haven't even gone through a full tax cycle yet. In fact, many of the tax rules were just released by the IRS within the last six to eight weeks. Not that, not that I'm complaining about that. They had so much rule and regulation to write. The, enterprise, or the Opportunity Zone regulation was just written at the end of last year. And yet, we're starting to see this sentiment really build in this country, whether it's re regard to Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Elizabeth Warren, even Howard Schultz is talking about fiscal responsibility. Uh, but the first two, Ale AOC and Warren, have both proposed plans that would incorporate raising taxes on the wealthy. What do you make of those proposals? Do you think that's what the economy needs at this time? Look, first of all, the U.S. tax code is very, very complicated. I spent, you know, over a year of almost every waking hour in the U.S. tax code. It's very, very complicated. So, you know, the one thing I would, I would tell people before they start talking about the U.S. tax code, they need to understand it. The U.S. tax code is really three different tax codes. We have a corporate tax code, which I think people understand. We have an individual tax code, which I'm not sure people understand. But most importantly, we have this tax code in the middle, which is the pass-through tax code, which is the vast majority of businesses in America. Right. The vast majority of people work for pass-through entities, which is really part of the personal income tax code. It's really this hybrid. Right. And the relationship between the corporate tax code and the pass-through tax code is very, very important. Because you know, people can always, people or businesses can always turn themselves into a corporation, or a corporation can always turn themselves into a pass-through. So you're saying so, that if there was some sort of wealth redistribution policy that was put in place, that people would just find ways to skirt it? Or? No, I'm, I'm saying that we've got to make a level playing field for everyone in the system. So, so if you and I were in the exact same business, and you were a corporation, and I'm a pass-through, and you were paying 20% income tax on your income, and I'm a pass-through, and I'm today I'm paying you know 37, less maybe 20%, but then my incremental rate goes up dramatically, I wouldn't be competitive in the world, you would be competitive in the world, I wouldn't even be competitive with you, I wouldn't even be competitive domestically. But these are individuals they're talking about, they're talking about no, billionaires. But, by the way, and... I'm talking about some of the biggest pass-throughs in, in the United States are bigger than some of the biggest corporations in the United States. But do you do you think that if this plan passes, and I don't even know if you think it has an, a, a chance of passing, that it would be harmful to the economy or helpful to the economy? It, it, would, it would be harmful to the economy, and I'm not, I'm not saying that collecting more tax revenue is harmful to the economy. I'm saying that we have to compete in a global theater. And when we looked at cutting the business tax and also cutting the pass-through tax down, the main driver for that was to allow U.S. companies to compete in a globalized world. So we were trying to tell U.S. companies to compete against companies in other parts of the world that were paying substantially less tax than their U.S. competitor. Okay. And now we've got it more or less on a level playing field. Now, Gary, I have to ask you, um, because you are, you're here at a hedge fund conference, um, there are headlines about you joining the board of a, a blockchain startup, there are headlines about you joining a Harvard fellowship. Um, what, what, are, what are you doing these days? What is your act three? What are your plans for the future? Well, all those are true. Uh -huh. So you happen to be three for three there. Yeah. So I, I, I am involved in a blockchain business, and I believe very much blockchain as a business process makes an enormous amount of sense going forward. 
Um, I am continuing in the process I started in the U.S. government. Senator, former Senator Heidi Heidekamp and myself are going to be teaching a class at Harvard starting next week on what we call the real state of the union. It's going to be a policy, policy class at the Kennedy School where we're going to go through all of the big policy issues in the U.S. government, which I'm very excited to do to just continue to talk about many of these policy issues that have gotten very important to me. And I'm continually investing in new companies I think are really important for the United States. Look, one of the biggest competitive advantages we have as a country is we have an entrepreneurial spirit and we tend to invent some of the best companies in the world. And I'm having a great time working with some of those young inventors in the world. So we may see you show up in uh, Silicon Valley one of these days. You may. I'm out there a lot. All right. Gary Cohn, thank you so much. Great to see you.